And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of brass. It's interesting uh, that there's these mountains of brass here because Zechariah's time period is during the Medo-Persian Empire. What's the next empire that follows? The kingdom of brass. Greece. The symbols are consistent. You go back to the book of Daniel, and you'll find out the brass speaks of, if it, it's two mountains, it's two kings. In other words, I think what he's talking about is he sees it coming out of, remember, uh, Gr- uh, Greece was split into four different kingdoms. And I think he sees two of the, the kingdoms because mountains are kingdoms, right? So two of the kingdoms, that's where they, they came out of. They, these are like spirits of angels. Angels in God's economy, in the Bible, angels do God's work. God sits upon his throne. Jesus sits upon his throne. And they dispatch, continually angels are dispatched. Do this, do this, do this, do this, right? That's their job. When you were raptured up into heaven, and Jesus was taught me, he said, "Uh, neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they're like the angels. You're going to be like the angels. You're going to be dispatched. You're going to help him rule his upcoming kingdom. That's, That's what we see here. We have the spirits of these angelic beings that are going forth into all the earth to make sure that everything is done according to what God wants done. So as we see that uh, verse 2, in the first chariot were red horses, the second chariot were black horses, the shir- third chariot were white horses, the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Then I said, what are these, my Lord? And the angel said, these are four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Now these are not them seven spirits before his throne, or there would have been seven of them. There are four. Now, how many quarters of the earth does the Bible say there are? Four quarters, right? Makes sense. If there was five quarters, it wouldn't arithmetically make sense, right? He talks about the four quarters of the earth. He talks about uh, when he's going to bring Israel back from the four quarters of the earth, or the four corners of the earth, right? Four is actually a a symbolic number that speaks of creation. I don't know if you've ever gotten into biblical numerology, but you got the the number one represents the Father, the number two, the Son, the number three is manifestation of the Holy Ghost, the number four has to do with creation. Yeah. These four horses, mm-hmm. they're stand, go forth and stand before the Lord of all the earth. Does that mean they're standing before Satan? No. Yes, Satan could be called the Lord of the earth. He's, in the New Testament, Paul calls him the God of, of the earth. He certainly seems to be in control of a lot of things. But God has never, he's never lost control of the universe. He's never lost control of this planet. At any point in time, in fact, before Jesus came, God could have just said, you know what, I've had enough. Away with you, I'm going to start over here with a brand new creation. And as far as Satan goes, boom, you're in a lake of fire forever. Everything that's being done is being done, orchestrated according to the plan and the purpose and the will of God. When you go through a trial, you need to real. You and I both. We need to realize we are going through what God has called for uh, upon us for our life at that time, and we shouldn't be afraid. The scripture says there is no fear in love. If God be for us, who shall be against us? Right? Satan is, we we, got to come to a point when we realize 
Satan, no matter, even if he's called the God of this earth, he's defeated. He's, defeated. he's nothing. He's nothing when it comes to... In fact, he's beneath your feet. We may not see it yet, but the scripture clearly says, Jesus, in fact, Jesus was told... Sit here until I make your enemies your footstool. Where does the footstool go? Under the feet of Christ. And who's the church? His body. So the, the least person, if you start with the head being the highest, which Jesus is the head, the lowest would be the bottom of the feet. Where's the stool? Underneath the lowest person in the body of Christ. Who's the enemy? Satan. In fact, in Romans, at the end of Romans, it says, soon God shall put, uh, you'll, you'll see the enemy, God shall put Satan under your feet, I think it says. So you can check that out in the, in the book of Romans there. We don't need to be afraid this is what we see here. We see the first chariot of red horses, the second chariot of black horses, the third white horse, and the fourth chariot of grizzled and bay horses. And he said, what are these? He said, these are four spirits of the earth which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. In other words, they are the ones that have been dispatched to go throughout the earth. The black horses go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzle go forth toward the south country. There's, so there's two main primary countries there. Well, that's interesting because that actually conforms to what I said before about the two mountains of Greece. Because remember we brought up about the, the, uh, the Maccabees and uh, the, uh, the pollution of the, the temple during 168 B.C.? Well, that Antiochus Epiphanes, he came from uh, the uh, Syrian, uh, the Syrian uh, kingdom, which came from uh, the, uh, there was one of the split offs of, of uh, Greece. There were four kingdoms. The prominent ones was the one in the north and the one in the south, the one in the south being Egypt. And you had this conflict going back and forth and back and forth. And, and Daniel, 11th chapter of Daniel, talks a lot about that. So here, here we got that. We got the, the uh, black horses went into the north. White went after them. The grizzled went toward the south. The bay went forth, sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. What are they doing? They're walking to and fro, all going all throughout the earth. And he said, get ye hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. In other words, they were dispatched. They were commanded, go through the whole earth. And basically, they're spying out, they're scouting out the land. You know, in, in the olden days, I don't know if they have scouts now, but in the olden days, when you had like the, the, the Civil War, <laughs> you had scouts. They would, you know, they would, you, you didn't have cell phones, you didn't have satellite, you know, pictures where you could zoom in. You didn't have Google Earth. You could say, oh, here comes the enemy. You had to have somebody go out and spy. So scouts were spies, right? That's what they're doing. They're spying out the land for God. And then verse 8, then cried he upon me and said, behold, these that go for the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. But it, obviously, there's something supernatural. It's showing you that God is in control. No matter what happens, God is in control. If Trump gets elected, God put him there. If Hillary would have got elected, we would have had to say, God, God allowed her to be put in there. But what's going on today? We see the, the 
The church was very active in getting Trump elected. Good for this country. Good for Israel. Good for God's plans and purpose. He's a supporter of, of the Jews. He's, a, he, he's a pretty much slapped the United Nations right in the face and said, we're going to protect our ally. We're, we're going to put our embassy in Jerusalem like it's supposed to be. The capital of Israel is Jerusalem. He's the first president. I mean, everybody talks about how great Ronald Reagan was, and I believe he was, but he's the first president that had the guts to say, we're going to move that embassy where it belongs. And he, do you think there was an outcry? The rest of the world went, oh, no, oh, no, you can't do that, you can't do that. Revelation chapter 6, we're going to read about the four horses to begin with here. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as if it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And it goes on to talk about some of the other seals. Now, just to give you a recap of, um, if you're not familiar, in Revelation chapter 4, John is caught up to the highest heaven, and there he sees the throne of God. And in the fifth chapter, he sees in the hand of he who is sitting on the throne, he sees a scroll that has seven seals, or a small book, if you will. In the old days, it used to be a scroll. It had seven seals on it, and he said, well, no one was worthy to loose the seals. And then in Revelation chapter 6, we have the loosing of the seals. Now, I believe, and we can't get into it uh, because of time tonight, but uh, I believe that this uh, scroll is actually the title deed to the earth. Whoever is able to loose those seals is the owner of this property called, or this uh, real estate called the planet Earth. Praise God. And we're going to see that in a minute, but um, in Revelation uh, chapter 5, 5, it says, And one of the elders say unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Now, if the Lion of David, everybody know who the Lion of uh, Judah is? Lion of Judah is the son of David? And the Lion of David, <laughs> the root of David. He is Jesus. Jesus, our Jesus, or Jesus Christ, if you will. And he's the one who has the right to open and loose those seals. And uh, I believe, as many people do, that where he has given us the interpretation or the loosing of these seals is in what they call the Olivet Discourse. And, and it's kind of a funny name, but all it means is he was having a discourse or communicating the unfolding of this prophecy, and he happened to be on the Mount of Olives, and so theologians call it the Olivet Discourse. Okay? Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, and we'll see the unfolding of, and, and in fact, this, uh, this Olivet Discourse actually unfolds the entire chapter of Revelation chapter 6. But all of the Olivet Discourse you can find in Matthew 24, 1 to begin with. And we read, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto him, See ye not all these things? He's pointing to the temple. 
Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and that's where we get the Olivet Discourse, the disciples came unto him privately saying, now watch these three questions, tell us when, uh, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? There's actually three questions there. When shall these things be? In other words, you could rephrase that. When shall the temple be torn down? They're asking Jesus, when shall the temple be torn down? He just said, not one stone will be left upon another. Also, what shall be the sign of thy coming? In other words, what sign will alert us to your return? That's why it's sometimes confusing when you're reading this because Jesus is actually answering three different questions. And the other is, what shall be the sign of the end of the world? All this included in that, in that chapter there. In other words, teach us the events leading up to the end of the age. Now, there's also three different versions. You'll find one in Matthew chapter 24, 4 through 42. We're not going to read it all. Ma uh, Mark chapter 13, 5 through 32. And then there's Luke's version, which we're going to take a look at here. We're going to go ahead and look at Luke. So turn to chapter, uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 8. And this will kind of give us a narrative of what he's speaking of in Revelation chapter 6. Because the whole idea of this picture, by the way, and I'll explain it, this is Jesus showing that he is the lion, the symbols there showing he is the lion of David. He's also the lamb that, the lamb that was uh, slain from the foundation of the world. He's got uh, seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. But you'll see in his hand he is rolling out this scroll. He's loosing the seals. And that's what that picture represents. I think it's a wonderful rendition there. But let's look at Luke chapter 21, verse 8, and see what this is all about. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For men Now, keep in mind that he's answering these three questions that... Uh, you know, when shall these things be? In other words, when shall the temple be torn down? What sign will alert us to your return? When shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? All right? Those, those three questions is what he's answering here. So in 21.8, Luke, he says, Take heed that you be not to see, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said unto them, he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines and pestilences and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these they shall lay their hands on you, persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all, with uh, all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess your souls. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed or surrounded with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, unto the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves of roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with 
power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Notice that when you see these things begin to come to pass. He, said, he didn't say, wait till all these things happen and look up. He says, when you see it all beginning to happen, to look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. And he spoke to them a parable, behold, the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. And here's a very important verse. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. I run into people all the time that don't believe the prophetic word is going to happen. They said, well, you know, God put a hold on that, or he changed his mind, or, you know, since Israel rejected uh, Jesus, and now we have the church, God's not going to pro- fulfill all those prophecies that the, the prophets wrote. Well, why did God have them write the words? You know, there's a temple in the book of the last part of Ezekiel that's never been built. And I don't know, maybe eight chapters where God talks about the, a millennial temple being built, and some tell us, well, that's never going to be fulfilled. But yet God tells us not to speak any idle words. Does God speak idle words? I don't think so. And here is very important scripture. Heaven and earth shall pass away. You want to see something uh, supernatural and mighty and wonderful? Watch heaven and earth pass away. But his words shall never pass away. They will be fulfilled. Take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness, and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unaware, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always. How many times? Always. On Monday? Always. Tuesday? Always. Pray always. Who? Anyone who hears this word. All of you, watch and pray always. Always, why? That you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, a lot of people, and I wouldn't run into a lot of people, and they, got, they have the idea, they say, you know, I don't have anything to worry about, I'm leaving. But the Scripture says, watch and pray that you might be accounted worthy. And I don't take anything for granted. The Scripture says, pray that you be accounted worthy. Pray that you be accounted worthy. Okay, let's analyze some of this stuff here. The first question we were asking, he, they said, when shall all these things be? And I'm back in Matthew chapter 24. I just wanted to read that Luke account. And we're not going to get into Mark and, and the Matthew account, but I gave you those scriptures. But one of the questions was, when shall the temple be torn down? And Jesus was answering. In other words, when shall all these things be? This, by the way, is the Roman soldiers that came into the temple when the temple was torn down in 70 A.D. That the, the Olivet Discourse here, that Jesus, that whole thing that we just read, really unfolds this whole Revelation chapter 6. The first white horse, many are agreed, is a symbol that represents religious deception. Now, many people say that this is the Antichrist. Rising up, white riding on a white horse. Well, why do they say that? Well, in Revelation chapter 19, we have a rider on a white horse. That rider is called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and upon him is written the Word of God. There is no doubt who that is. That person is Jesus Christ. This person is not. This person is not Jesus Christ. It is a rider on a white horse. Well, many people say, well, this not only... Uh, uh, this not only means religious deception, but it also is a is the Antichrist as a character or identified as a, as the Antichrist riding on the white horse. The problem we have with that, and I'm not poo pooing the whole idea, but the problem we have, we okay, we can identify the rider on the white horse. Who's on the red horse and the black horse and the uh, and the, the pale pale green or or piebald, or, you know, some of your training translations will say different things. It represents a very sickly, almost dying horse. Well, who are these other riders? Nobody ever identifies those. 
What they say is, well, these other horses are symbols that represent other things. Well, that doesn't sit well with me. You know, I, I, would, I, I would like it better if they said, well, the white horse is the Antichrist, and the red horse and the black horse and the, and the green horse or pale horse or whatever, that's Mo, Larry, and Curly. You know, at least you've identified them, you know? But to say that's the Antichrist, now that's not saying it doesn't represent also the Antichrist, but it's a symbol representing religious deception. Now Jesus is going to unfold some of this, and we're going to see him unfold that. But in the days of Christ, or shortly thereafter, the religious deception that it represented was the Roman imperial cult. Now, what that is, if you don't know, the emperors of Rome were worshipped as God in the flesh. If you did not worship them, then you, were, you could lose your head over it. Okay? This was the primary religion of importance in that day. And in that day, October A.D. 66, actually, because remember, they asked Jesus, they said, when is the temple going to be torn down? And he's going to answer that. And he says that... One stone will not be uh, turned upon another, uh, and, and it's all going to be turned down. Well, there was this religious deception which would propel or cause this destruction of the temple. Well, the temple priests uh, announced in that day that they refused to honor the Roman emperors anymore. See, what the temple priests had agreed to do was offer up sacrifices in the temple and prayers for the Roman emperor. Well, then they came and they said, no more, we're not going to do it anymore. And that just got the Roman emperor pretty upset. And so he was going to send in soldiers. In fact, they sent in two or, or more legions, a legion of 6,000 people, into uh, Jerusalem to take over the temple and to stop the sacrifices and whatnot. But you'll see that there's a rising of this white horse in Jesus, or shortly after Jesus' day, a religious deception. Now, I believe that these riders on the horse, they're actual spiritual entities that were riding then and will have continued to ro ride. And the frequency that they're riding, even today, continues to increase as we, uh, as we see. Now, again, the, the culmination of religious deception, sure, the Antichrist fits in there. But to say that this rider on the white horse is the Antichrist, I, don't, I really don't think that uh, you can say that. There was a mention of the red horse in Jesus, Matthew uh, 24, 6. Jesus says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. All right, what happened after this religious deception... This, imper this Roman imperial cult was pronounced and they rejected, the Jews rejected to honor this uh, religious system, this, if you will, this system of the, the religion of the empire. The next thing that happened was a war horse was loosed. And Jesus said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, why are we looking at the historical part to see if Jesus' words were fulfilled to the letter as far as historical, we can be guaranteed that these things are going to have a latter-day fulfillment for us because this is all in type. But in October A.D. 66, this is exactly what happened. The Jews resisted the Roman imperial cult and this uh, general by the name of Sucius Gallius came in with over two legions, again, over 12,000 soldiers, and came in to surround Jerusalem and surround the temple and they were, they were going to exterminate them. But there was something strange that happened, and that strange thing was, some, for some reason, they made some sort of a peace agreement with the temple priests. Now, do you remember Jesus' words? He said, when you shall see Jerusalem surrounded by troops, flee. Flee. Now, here... In A.D. 66 is the fulfillment of Jesus' words that Jerusalem became surrounded with troops. But you know what? If you were there, it was too late to flee. But something strangely and almost miraculous happened. They backed off. Cestius Gallius left one legion of troops there by the temple. They made some sort of a peace agreement 
which scriptures we know the Antichrist in the last day is supposed to make a peace treaty for seven years, right? Keep that in mind. Well, that's what happened in that day as a type of what uh, of, of a type of what's going to happen in the future. Cestius Gallius withdrew from Jerusalem, and did they did not return for three and a half years. In other words, the pro, Jesus warned. He said, "When you see Jerusalem circled with troops, flee into the wilderness." Well, how do you do that when you're encircled? Well, there was this withdrawing which opened it up for three and a half years. What that meant is anyone who believed Jesus' words at that time could flee and be spared the destruction that was going to come. In other words, the destruction of the temple and the city and the massacring of everyone that was there. And Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon another. In Luke chapter 21, verse 20, and 21, and you don't have to keep turning all these if you uh, don't want to, but uh, if you prefer to, that's fine. But Luke chapter 21, verse 20 says, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let him which are in Judea, or them which are in Judea, flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Let not them that are in the countries enter there into for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now again, this is not the latter day fulfillment, but what's interesting about this is, see, you will hear people, when you start um, embracing uh, last day prophecy, you will hear ministers say, well, you know, you're following a, a, a falsehood because that stuff was fulfilled in Jesus' day. And it's a historical fact that it was, but it does not preclude that there won't be a latter-day fulfillment. It's called dual fulfillment of prophecy. A lot of times God shows us what is going to happen so we know kind of what to expect in the future. And this destruction Jesus spoke of of the, of the temple in Jerusalem happened once before even that with Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 B.C. He rose out of Syria. He came from the north. He was a Syrian ruler. Came into Jerusalem and he Sack, he tore down the uh, parts of the temple, burned down parts of the temple, and offered a swine on the altar to Zeus. On the Jewish altar, he offered a swine to Zeus, and he created what the Jews called the de abomination of desolation. Well, it's very interesting that in, in 70 AD, the uh, Romans are going to come. Now, in this case, it was Vespian. And the, Romans, the uh, Roman emperor Nero at the time, uh, his son Titus, and they came and they planned to siege Jerusalem after those three and a half years. And when they came into the city, there was a great massacre. And they also offered up a swine. And you can see that uh, in this picture here, if you look right here, a swine on the temple and polluted that. Now remember Jesus' words. He said, there would be an abomination of desolation which would pollute the temple. So the, so the soldiers would surround Jerusalem and the city and then there would be this abomination which maketh desolate is what it says in the King James. Abomination which maketh desolate. However, that, even though that happened, there's still an abomination of desolation yet to come by the Antichrist in that 70th week of Daniel, which we spoke of um, a couple weeks ago. We also read in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That time of the Gentiles is the period known as the 70th week of Daniel in prophecy. Now, what happened 
when the when these Romans came back three and a half years later, what actually happened to the people that were in Israel or in in uh, Jerusalem there? Well, at least a quarter of a million Jews were brutally put to death through starvation, burning, shot through with arrows, crucified, hacked up with pieces, and many others were enslaved, leading to their eventual death. Straight out of the history book. Jesus warned the people as a, in the ministry of the prophet what was going to happen. And he said, when you see the, the land of Israel surrounded, or land of Judah surrounded, Jerusalem surrounded by soldiers, get out of there. Well, he says, he says the same thing to the people of our generation, to the people living in Judah. He says, when you see this happen, to flee. And in fact, in Revelation chapter 12, we see a woman fleeing into wilderness. How many have heard of the lost city of Petra, where Israel is supposed to flee in the last days, where they will be protected for 42 months? Well, this is a prophecy for latter days. Matthew 24, 15, we read, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. That abomination of desolation, like I said, here we see the, the pig offered up on the sacrifice. The Jews saw it in 168 B.C., the same thing. The interesting thing to note is twice the... Um, type of Antichrist who would pollute the temple came from the land of Syria, the king of the north of you. If you look at a map, Syria is right north of Jerusalem. What, that would strongly suggest, it doesn't mean that the Antichrist has to be Syrian, which many people have, uh, uh, have uh, told us or taught, but what it does suggest is if, if the first type, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a Syrian ruler, came from Syria and destroyed the temple and, and polluted it with the offering of the, the swine. And then the second one, he was a Roman general, but he's, he, was, he's, he was general over the land of Syria. Then he came in from the north there. Where is the Antichrist probably going to come from when he goes into the temple and he offers that final abomination of desolation? Now, it doesn't say it's the swine, the abomination which makes desolate in the day of Antichrist is what Antichrist goes into the temple of God proclaiming himself that he is God. The, the prophecy types suggest that he will come out of the land of Syria into Jerusalem when he comes into that temple to pollute it. The other thing that actually occurred in that time period, we read in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, which coincides again with one of these horses, is there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All of that happened as a, re as a result during that time period. We're talking around 70 A.D., in fact, remember we read about how it said that uh, your own family members would rise up and, and they would turn you in and, and uh, you know, take advantage of you? Well, historically there were gangs that rose up in the land of Jerusalem and they began to attack and terrorize the Jews. And they were Jews themselves. A quarter of a million Dead bodies lie in Jerusalem after that. And what happens when you have a quarter of a million dead bodies in a city and no one will bury them? What do you think happens? It sets the stage for great pestilence and disease. The slaughter that God is speaking of in the last days is such that not only a quarter million uh, people would be dead in Jerusalem, but a quarter of the earth will be laying dead in the destruction that's coming soon upon this earth. Dead bodies will be from one place to the other. And there will be pestilence and disease on the rampage. There will be extreme famine. One of the things that happened in the days of literal fulfillment of Jesus' words was when, when Jerusalem was uh, invaded, there was also great 
famine. The famine was so great, history says that the women would eat their own babies to survive. That's how bad it got. Well, you know what? The scripture also says the great tribulation period is nothing compared with, I mean, this time that we talk about historically is nothing compared with what the great tribulation will be. The famine will be so great, people will be not only eating their own babies, they'll be trying to steal yours. And there will be babies during the tribulation period. Because it's, it talks about the, if a woman has a child, it sucks. It gives suck. Just about everyone in Jerusalem literally died in that day. It has a direct fulfillment of the Scriptures. At least 97,000 men and children were taken into captivity as prisoners, and many of them would face the animals in the amphitheaters. How many of you have ever seen any, like the, the movie The Gladiator? you ever seen that? You know, this, <laughs> this stuff really happened. Many Jews were compelled to dig the Corinthian Canal in Greece. Many others were sent to Egypt to toil there to their death as slaves, and some were sold to the Gentiles living in Judea as slaves. They were sold for mere pennies due to the great dirt and poor economy throughout the land. All right, so we very quickly have given you kind of an overview of the historical fulfillment, and I might say the literal historical actual fulfillment of Jesus' words. So if anybody comes to you and says, you don't believe in those last day prophecies, this stuff was already fulfilled. You say, I know it was already fulfilled. And you know what? I believe it's going to be fulfilled again. Only on a much greater scale. See, this is a prophetic type of what is going to happen not only in Jerusalem, but all over the world. Now let's go ahead and look at Revelation chapter 6. And let's consider some of this. Let's look at the actual seals here. Revelation chapter 6. Verse 1, we see this white horse coming out. Verse 1, When I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts said, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth, conquering and to conquer. And the thing that everybody always points out is the rider has a bow and he has a crown, but he has no arrows. And yet, he goes conquering and conquering, and many say he will begin his conquest with, uh, with peace. Well, isn't that a, a, an adequate sign for religious deception. Another reason this represents religious deception is because, again, what did we say? Revelation chapter 19, we have a rider on the white horse which represents the true, the faithful, the true Son of God, the Messiah who shall come, he who speaks the prophetic words of truth. This rider on this white horse, he represents the complete opposite. He is the counterfeit religious system of the earth. It's not just one religious system. It is the counterfeit of everything that is true. Well, what is the true? This is the true. The Word of God. That's the truth. You know, someone might bring you a Koran to you. The Koran's not true. It doesn't belong in the same place as this book that I hold in my hand. Someone will say, well, what about the teaching of Buddha? You know what? Buddha's dead. Muhammad's dead. Zoroaster's dead. But Jesus is alive and he's returning. Every other religious system is represented by this white horse. That's why I shrink back at saying that this just represents the Antichrist. No, it represents all false religion. All false religions represented by this. And we just read about, about some of uh, this, but let's... Look there, don't lose your place in Revelation chapter 6 because we are coming right back. We're Revelation or Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 and 5. I just want to read these two scriptures because Jesus is going to unfold what the meaning of these seals are here. In verse 4 and 5, Matthew 24, uh, verse 4 and 5, he says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. 
take heed. Is it possible that we could be deceived? If it were not possible, Jesus would not have said it because Jesus does not speak idle words. It is possible for even the elect to be deceived. It is very, very important, especially as we approach the times of the end. It's very important that we pay attention to the Word of God. The Word of God. People will be deceived and swallowed up. Why? Because they did not have a love of the truth whereby they could have been saved. But Matthew 24, 4 says, Take heed, no man deceive you for many. How many? Many is a lot. Not just one. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. That has a twofold application, I believe. This says, many will come saying, I am Christ. Now, this is Jesus talking. It's like me saying, many will come saying, I am Ron. And, and deceive, deceive many. many. Well, does that mean they're claiming to be me? Or does that mean that they're saying that I'm Ron and still deceive you? See, many will come standing on the pulpit saying, Jesus is the Messiah, and yet they will deceive. See, many will come saying, I am Christ and deceive many. And we see that happening all over. But then others will stand there and say, I'm the Christ. You know, Reverend Moon claimed to be the Christ. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy, a Christian science, she claimed to be a female version of Christ. Many people have come and many people will come claiming to be Christ and deceive many. But many will come claiming Jesus is the Christ and they'll still deceive many. At the end time, there will be a one world religion. And this is the beginning of it. We are seeing it. It's in our, and why is it happening? Because remember, the mortal wound is inflicted on the beast with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But today you don't have people that even know the word of God. How, how did you know the word of God when you were a kid? You memorized it. In Sunday school class, you memor- You can't memorize it anymore because everybody's got something says something different. All the translations say something different. It's deliberate. It's to prevent you. And then, you know, I used to think it was really good that they had all these study Bibles. But now I realize that the study Bibles are filled with all these footnotes and the footnotes always generate unbelief. See, if you just read the scripture and you say, this is the word of God, I may not understand it, but it's the word of God. But then they say, they'll say things like, for instance, have you ever seen this? There's a footnote that says, you know where it says in his in the in it, his number is six six six. Do you ever see a footnote in the Bible that says some versions say six sixteen? Some manuscripts said six sixteen. Who do you think came up with that? And that's what it does. It generates it generates unbelief in the Word of God. You don't need all these footnotes suggesting this manuscript says this or this manuscript. You've got the word of God. If the church was silent 20 years ago, well, that was one thing. But to say today that, well, I don't want to be political. How can you not be political? William Wilberforce, about whom I've written and I mentioned in the book along with Bonhoeffer, he was dealing with the slavery issue and the slave trade. He knew it was satanic and he was political in saying we've got to do what we can because we're Christians. And when people say, but you're being political, he would say, no, I'm simply doing what God commands me to do, to be a voice for the voiceless. The African slaves don't have a voice. If I don't speak, God will judge me. If I don't speak for the unborn today, God will judge me. Eric, what specifically then do Christians need to do? Do we need to attend school board meetings, run for office? I mean, beyond just speaking up, what should we do? Well, we need to do everything. In other words, I think that if, if when we talk about the church, we're talking about multiplied millions of Americans uh, who each has a different calling. So we just have to ask God, Lord, what would you have me to do? But do something. We had pulpits uh, on fire uh, before the revolution advocating against tyranny. They weren't afraid to be political. Who can you trust? 
You can trust the Word of God. That's it. You can, I mean, if you're going to lay your life on the altar, if you're going to trust in anything, let it be the Word of God. Let it be the Word of God. Let me show you something here that the Lord gave me, and I think this is really neat, about this white horse. See, the devil is a counterfeiter. I have two $10 bills here. One of them is right, and one of them is wrong. Can you tell the difference here? Can you see that there's a difference between those two? See, one is like, one is like the, um, the white horse Jesus. One's the true, and then one kind of looks like it. Kind of look, but it's false, right? You know what? If I was a counterfeiter, I would not make one that looked so obvious that people could tell. Because I'm going to get caught. And I'll tell you what, the rider on the white horse, there are religious systems out there that you cannot tell which one is the true and which one is the counterfeit. The only way you can tell is by the Word of God. When the false prophet rises up in Revelation chapter 13, he said he had two horns and he looked like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. And the only way you can tell is by knowing the words of God. That is your protection. This is how deceptive the false religious systems are will be and actually you know many i said many people want to put that white horse and say that's the antichrist because they want a real simple unfolding of the book of revelation so they can say right here white horse comes out of the seal and here begins the seven year tribulation and everything we read about happens in seven years you know what i'll tell you if this symbol is religious deception you see these two bills? I am, I am going to tell you, there are people all over the world that cannot tell the truth from the error. Multiplied, not millions, billions of people. Billions of people. More people are lost than are saved. More people are in the false religious systems than are in the truth. I mean, I was raised Roman Catholic, and I realized that many people in the Roman Catholic Church, they love Jesus, according to their understanding. Some of them do read the Bible. There are Bible studies. Some of them are trying to tr teach the truth. But I would venture to say, and I don't have the exact statistic, but based upon my knowledge, I would say 99% of them never even read the Scriptures. Now, now that may not, you know, I, I can't give you the exact, but I can tell you there's very few. And the ones that do know, most of them are staying there trying to reach the people. That's why they're there. They're just trying to get the word into the... They see it as a mission. Most of those people are complete. They can't tell the one bill from the other. At least they know that, you know, they've heard that Jesus is the Son of God. But, I, you know, the Muslims, they, they don't know. You know, the Hindus, they don't know. I mean, they're following religious systems that are guaranteeing them salvation in one form or the other. The only truth is the truth that we have. The only God is the God that we have. The others won't do any good. The reason I mentioned that about the counterfeit, because this white horse is, you know, as people say it's going to come, it's going to come. It's here! Religious deception is great, so great. I mean, most of the people are deceived by one form of religious deception. Joining us now from Rome is David Hathaway, a Protestant pastor and president of the Eurovision Mission to Europe. After the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014, I was able to call all the Christian denominations together and, and that's a miracle because I had Catholic, I had Orthodox, I had all the Evangelicals, the Pentecostal, the Charismatic, every single denomination. And I asked them one question, 
I said, look, we can work together in prayer if we forget all religious doctrines and if you will accept only two things. One, the only authority in the church is the Bible. And secondly, the only salvation is in the name of Jesus. They all agreed. And for six years, we had prayer meetings with 10,000 people. And the interesting thing is that the people who were praying, leading the prayers, were the heads of every single denomination on the platform. Pope Francis' message uh, today to the religious leaders was that the religion is not a problem, but actually a part of the solution. He also said that uh, to combat the world's crisis, we must care. He stressed that um, as long as inequality and injustice continue to proliferate, uh, there will be no end to viruses, even worse than COVID-19. He said that uh, God is peace. He said that uh, every human being is uh, sacred, but each day children born and unborn, um, migrants and elderly are cast aside. And this is because of indifference. The rider on the red horse comes forth. Verse, uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. There went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given him a great sword, not just a little dinky sword, you know, not just a little pocket knife, it was given this great big sword. And the thing that I think of, what is the greatest sword that has been given to mankind from World War II when we, when we started using atomic bombs? Now we've got nuclear bombs. We've got chemical and biological weapons. The red horse has been given a great sword, enough power to destroy humanity. We, and, and you know what? It doesn't say that the people will be destroyed yet. It just says about the red horse, he'll take peace from the earth. How many believe that peace has been taken from the earth? You know what? The only one that really has peace is the one who has Jesus Christ because they know how it's all going to unfold. Peace has been taken from the earth and the weapons, the great sword is already in his hand. No one can convince me that that red horse rider is not riding today throughout the world. But it gets worse. If Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. What do, what, how, will you, how will you do that exactly, since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will, uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. With regard to Nord Stream 2, uh, we continue to have uh, very strong and clear conversations uh, with our German allies, and I want to be clear with you today. If Russia invades Ukraine, one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward. Uh, as you all know, these pipelines weren't pumping gas into Europe at this time. Uh, NS2 was never operational, as you guys know. NS1 has not been operational for weeks because uh, Putin has weaponized uh, energy, and we have said this many times before. This just drives home the importance of our efforts to work together to get alternative gas uh, supplies to Europe and to support efforts to reduce gas uh, consumption and accelerate true energy in Independence by moving to clean energy economy. 
to start today by talking about a politician on the right who we should all be worried about, who's on the rise today, a politician who has brushed off accusations of fascism. What separates us from, let's say, Italy, who elected a, a fascist? She is from fascist roots. A far-right political party whose roots go back to post-World War II neo-fascist. A party that has its roots in Italian fascism. They said it could never happen again. 100 years ago, Mussolini marching on Rome, plunging the country into two decades of dictatorship, an alliance with Hitler, and a second world war. Today, the fascist party is gone, but many say these are their political heirs, the brothers of Italy. Once on the fringes, they ballooned into the biggest party in the country. Now their leader, Giorgia Maloney, is poised to head the most hard right government since Il Duce. The 45-year-old firebrand insists she's no fascist, just a proud conservative and nationalist. Comfortable, nevertheless, with some of the hallmarks of Italian fascism, like this motto. God, fatherland, and family. Perché tutto quello che ci definisce in questo tempo è un nemico. Per chi vorrebbe che non avessimo più un'identità e che fossimo solamente schiavi, consumatori perfetti. E allora è sotto attacco l'identità nazionale, è sotto attacco l'identità religiosa, è sotto attacco l'identità di genere, è sotto attacco l'identità familiare. Non devo potermi definire italiana, cristiana, donna, madre, no. Io devo essere cittadino X, genere X, genitore 1, genitore 2, devo essere un numero. Perché quando sarò solamente un numero, quando non avrò più un'identità, quando non avrò più radici, beh allora sarò lo schiavo perfetto in balia della grande speculazione finanziaria. Il consumatore perfetto. Fuochi verranno attizzati per dimostrare che 2 più 2 fa 4. Spade verranno sguainate per dimostrare che le foglie sono verdi in estate. Quel tempo è arrivato, signori. Siamo pronti. Grazie. Everything we stand for is under attack. Our individual freedom is under attack. Our rights are under attack. The sovereignty of our nation is under attack. The prosperity and well-being of our family is under attack. The education of our children is under attack. In front of this, people understand that in this age, the only way of being rebels is to preserve what we are. The only way of being rebels is to be conservatives. Only a few months ago, European Union bureaucrats wrote a document hundreds of pages long telling us that in order to be inclusive we had to exclude all references to Christmas. Jesus, Mary and all Christian names were to be removed from all official communication. Will we surrender in front of this? No, we will not. We will fight it. We will fight it standing tall. Today, we are all keen to hear from His Royal Highness his mission for a more cohesive and sustainable world. The interdependence between human health and planetary health has never been more clear. As we start a new decade, it is time to focus on the future we wish to build. To that end, building on my Sustainable Markets Initiative, I am launching the Terra Carta as the basis of a recovery plan for nature, people, and planet. More than 800 years ago, the Magna Carta inspired a belief in the fundamental rights and liberties of people. As we strive to imagine the next 800 years of human progress, the fundamental rights and value of nature lie at the heart of the Terra Carta. I am calling on CEOs from around the world to engage and play their part in leading the global transition. To guarantee our future, we have no other choice. Billionaire globalist corporations will own everything. Homes, factories, farms, cars, furniture. 
and everyday citizens will rent what they need if their social credit score allows. The plan of the Great Reset is that you will die with nothing. To pull off this evil plan, Klaus Schwab's World Economic Forum will need to take more than just material possessions from Australians. Senators in this very chamber today who support the Great Reset threaten our privacy, freedom and dignity. Yes, they're in this Senate chamber. Very soon, government will tell our farmers what they can grow and punish Australian consumers if they buy the wrong things. This has already started with frightening reforms scheduled for Australian agriculture. The dream of micromanaging individual carbon emissions hinges on the soon to be passed so-called trusted digital identity bill. It is only through the relentless digital stalking of citizens that the Liberal Nationals government can micromanage purchasing choices. Australian banks have already shown a keen interest in the trusted digital identity bill, saying it will, quote, allow them to create a rich view of their customers. These are the same banks that already list climate risk as a means to deny loans. So let's talk about whether the right, whether they're dying out. I mean, what is happening here? Because, no, look at Italy, Georgia Maloney is going to become the Italian Prime Minister. Look at Sweden two weeks ago. That country ruled by Social Democrats since 1945 until now. There's going to be a Conservative majority leading Sweden. Actually, all over the world, you know, we are seeing a move against globalism. Because what's globalism done is made the rich richer and disadvantaged absolutely everybody else. But somehow, somehow in our countries, we get people who masquerade at election time as being conservatives, don't have the courage to stand up and fight for our values. They're desperate for leadership in Australia and they don't see where it's coming from. But also they feel, and quite rightly so, that it's an assault on all fronts, that what was status quo yesterday mm -hmm. is far right today. Very soon people will walk around with biometric sensors on or even inside their bodies and will allow uh, Google or Facebook or the Chinese government or whoever to constantly monitor what's happening inside my body. The whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election, or whether in the supermarket this is my free will, that's over. We have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale. New surveillance technologies that are now deployed just to deal with this coronavirus uh, outbreak. When it's over, some governments may say, yes, but there is a second wave of corona coming, so we have to be prepared. And there is Ebola, and there is also regular flu. Why not protect people against that too with this new surveillance system? So the tendency would be to prolong it uh, indefinitely. Also, it's the moment when surveillance goes really under the skin. Governments are now not, not just interested in where we go and who we meet, but even in what's happening inside our bodies. Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. 
And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. He that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Every commentator that I've ever checked, every one unanimously has said this rider on the, this black horse represents a world famine. Represents a world famine. You say, well, then we're safe, right? We're eating pretty good. Well, some of us aren't. There are considered three categories of underfed according to the United Nations. Now, they've labeled them chronic hunger, acute hunger, and hidden hunger. Now, here's chronic hunger. This is a group of people whose daily food... Now, this is the United Nations. World, you know, the world is telling us about this report. There's a group of people whose daily food intake is inadequate for health, growth, and minimum energy needs with the potential to endanger life. Then there's acute hunger. These are folks threatened with imminent death because of an absolute shortage of food. Then there's hidden hunger. These are people unable to meet requirements for an adequate diet on a prolonged basis with the potential of shortening their lifespan. Virtually every country in the world, including the United States of America, has pockets of this kind of malnutrition. My commission, the way I see it, is to warn people that don't understand we are living in this time period already. And it's getting worse. It isn't getting better. This week, a protest in China crushed by officials. Who were the protesters? People who had lost their life savings. China's banks are going through a major crisis. And these are people from the Henan province. In the month of April, four banks in Henan stopped withdrawals meaning people who had deposited money in these banks could not withdraw. The people struggled for months. They protested at least thrice, and every time the Chinese state responded with a fierce crackdown. Look at this headline, China mortgage boycott data erased by censors as crisis spreads. This story broke today. And when Chinese censors swing into action, it is often an indication that there is a big problem. According to one report, the boycott is happening in as many as 86 cities. How many projects? More than 230. How much money are we talking about? At least $58 billion. That's the value of all the loans in delayed housing projects. How will China revive these projects? Its options are limited. China's property sector has become one of its biggest liabilities. Recent defaults have put banks at risk. The actual debt pile is much bigger. Again, I have some numbers. Chinese banks have lent $9.2 trillion to the property sector. And more than half of these are mortgage loans. So we've seen all of this before. This is exactly what happened in the year 2008, the subprime mortgage crisis in America. That's what it was. The bigger problem is the fact that China is trying to hide all of it. The world needs to know about China's bad loans. In 2020, it hit the spread of the Wuhan virus and the world got a pandemic. In 2022, China is hiding another crisis that could give us a financial pandemic. Revelation chapter 6, verse 7, when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale, or I think some churches say a piebald or, or a green, horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth watch it to kill with the sword that's the second horse to use the weapons in the second horse's hands to kill with the sword and with hunger that's the other horse, the third horse we just worked on, or, or saw. The kill with the sword and hunger with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, if we put those four things together, here's what I see we have. To kill with the sword, we have nuclear weapons. To kill with hunger, we have famine. 
to kill with death, we have all kinds of sickness and disease. Think about chemical and biological weapons that are ready to be loosed on the earth. Chemical weapons that seem to fit with death as the beasts of the earth. These things are biological in nature and they were created in the laboratory using laboratory animals. We have a scenario which mimics this fourth seal even as we're here today. If I had to put my finger and say where I thought we were in the prophetic scenario, I would point right here to this black horse. Or this, uh, not black horse, but the pale horse. I think we are ready for one of the worst things that the world has ever seen. But we're ready for one of the best things. Because Jesus Christ is coming back. For some of us, remember, he said, pray that you be accounted worthy. Things we're hearing, I think, should urge us to pray, and not only urge us to pray about ourselves, but what about the billions of people that are lost? We don't have much time. What underpins a world order is always the financial system. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private, but what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life. Because that's the only measure of whether a world order really serves. So now is the time to think through how will we solve this? Mm. And that will be part of the answer of what will the new order work like. We don't have much time, I'll tell you that. Revelation chapter 6 verse 9 is the fifth seal. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now many will tell us that these are the tribulation martyrs. And I can buy that, except for what I, what I want to clarify is the warning that we may, there is no guarantee. A lot of people got this attitude because they've been raised in this country. They haven't seen what the rest of the Christians in the world have seen. They've got this attitude that God just wants to bless me and prosper me. And while that's true, Christians down through the last 2,000 of history, years of history have had to stand and stand firm in their faith, and many have had to pay dearly. We've already mentioned the, uh, the uh, amphitheater and how Christians and Jews and others were both fed um, to wild animals. Let me tell you some things that you may not be too familiar with, though. This is an actual historical event. The Anabaptists were beheaded by the Roman Catholic Church. The reason? Because the Roman Catholic Church, for, for like, I don't know how many miles, 12 to 20 miles outside Rome, these stakes appeared with the decapitated heads of the Anabaptists on them as warnings, we will not tolerate heresy. Well, you know where the, you know, how many know about the Baptist church? There's a Baptist church on every area. You know where they came from? They didn't come from the Reformation. They say they came from the Anabaptists. See, a lot of people also got this mistaken idea that there was one church and it split during the Reformation. That's not true. There was always a remnant all the way down through history resisting apostasy. 
And this was one of the groups. They were beheaded and threatened and it, like this, but it, it's even worse than that because uh, how many of you ever heard, uh, ever heard of the uh, Inquisition? It is estimated by some, and now the statistics vary, but the Roman Catholic Church really led the Inquisition, and it is estimated that at least 68 million people gave their lives. Now, not all of them were Christians. Some of them were Jews, and then there's some that were others. But many, 68 million or plus or minus a few were killed by one institution, one supposedly Christian institution. I want you to see what kind of enemy we're dealing with. Do you see the torture that, the, that was inflicted upon these people? Torture that was inflicted when people were thrown into, into being fed to, to hungry lions and bears and whatnot. We have an enemy out there who does, is, is merciless. And you know what? These people weren't saved out of it. They might have been saved through it. They may have been given supernatural strength. How many heard about people being burned at the stake? You want to see what some of the torture is? How many have seen uh, Braveheart? You want to see Brave? Yeah, take a look at Braveheart, the end of the movie, where he, he was in the Inquisition. You know, a Joan of Arc. You know, she was burned at the stake by the church. All because she believed she, you know, she believed in God. Basically, she's a little confused, but uh, you have to remember that uh, most people did not have a copy of the Word of God. This is the ovens of the Holocaust. It's estimated that between eight and eighteen million people were killed in the Holocaust. We say, well, uh, you know, those weren't Christians. Well, a lot of them were Christians. You know, they were all Jews. You know, in fact. There are more, the Russians claim there were more Russians killed than there were Jews in the Holocaust, about at least twice as many. <coughs> many of the Russians were Christian. What Revelation chapter, or the fifth seal shows is that there's going to be a great multitude slaughtered. Remember we talked about Babylon the Great, it said her cup is filled with the blood of the saints. I don't think that this just is ha happening in seven years. This has been happening all along. And it's not only, like I said, we're not picking on one institution. I am, I am picking on all of the counterfeit religious systems of the world. And I'm not picking on people. I'm picking on the institution because God spoke through His Son. And it is up to everyone to give ear to what Jesus Christ has said. There is no salvation in any other. Revelation, uh, Luke chapter... Uh, 21, 10. I'm going to skip over that part about Revelation. But Luke chapter 21, verse 10 says, Then said he unto them, again, Jesus is explaining some of this scenario. Luke 21, 10, he says, Nation shall rise against nation. We see that. Kingdom against kingdom. We see that in our day. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places. Divers places. That's not scuba divers. You know, <laughs> divers places. That's many places throughout the world. You'll see earthquakes. You say, earthquakes that's normal but not like this see jesus spoke of earthquakes that would be like birth pangs and it would increase in frequency as the child was ready to to come out to be born and so as as jesus is getting as the end is getting ready to be born upon the earth and the last days get closer and closer he says the earthquakes will be like birth pangs of greater frequency, of greater magnitude. Let's read this. And great earthquakes, 2111 Luke, great earthquakes shall be in divers places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. If you don't know Jesus Christ, and you're not scared, you're blind. You must be blind, deaf, and dumb or something. Because things are happening. You know what it is? It's that white horse is seducing the people and they don't even know what's going on. They don't know what's going on in front of their own eyes. They don't see it. They don't know it. Just like we in this country don't even realize that people are going to bed hungry because we're okay. But it's happening. It's happening. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. 
He talks about some more of the seals. And he said, I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. Now somebody might say, well, where does the rapture happen in all this? I don't know. You say, well, what do we want to listen to you for? You don't know anything. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know when the rapture happens. It could happen tonight. It could happen before we finish. I don't know. I got my own ideas. But I don't know. Revelation 6, 13, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Can you literally, what, what is being described when the heavens departs like a scroll? Is that going to be a fantastic sight or what? Not that I want to be here. <laughs> but is that going to be a fantastic sight to the world? And watch, what, you know, you would think when you saw that, you would think, my God, it's true. Lord, forgive me. Wouldn't you think? But see, that deceptive, that deceptive religion is so powerful. See, because there's demonic influence. Watch what happens. The, scroll, the, the, the heavens depart as a scroll when it's rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man, that's about everybody, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Well, that's probably a good place to go if you don't know the Lord. <laughs> 